So today I want to talk about enzymes. Enzymes are proteins that carry out chemical reactions in your body. This screen just shows you a few of the thousands of different types of enzymes in your body that carry out uh, almost all the reactions that uh, occur. When we say chemical reactions, uh, we could look at something like uh, making a large molecule or uh, possibly uh, other types of uh, such processes that occur as you grow, for example. On the other hand, we could look at uh, reactions where molecules are broken down uh, that is digested into smaller ones. We could look at, for example, digestion, literally, uh, that is uh, the process that occurs when you eat some food and uh, this food is broken down into small pieces that you can absorb and use as nutrients. Uh, these include various uh, macromolecules like proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids as well. When we say chemical reaction, we should uh, explain we are talking about the rearranging of atoms into new substances, that uh, these molecules here are different from the ones that you began with. If you didn't have enzymes, you wouldn't be very complex at all. You'd be a, a lifeless blob, a very uh, simple without many higher functions. That uh, enzymes allow you to carry out a variety of chemical reactions. You could look at, again, synthesis or digestion. That these reactions require an enzyme. That enzymes act as catalysts. This word here refers to a molecule that, uh, that allows another reaction to occur without itself being affected or used up in this process. When we say activation energy, what we mean specifically is uh, a, uh, a way of thinking about how reactions get started, that reactions might occur spontaneously, but sometimes have a small hump to get over before they can actually begin. We can, think of, uh, we can use an analogy to explain this process, that if you imagine that uh, you have a, uh, a big boulder that uh, would by itself roll down this hill, but imagine there's a small hill in the way that it would pick up speed and begin rolling by itself, but for this small impediment or hold up. That in the same way, if we think about cells, that reactions that occur where a reactant is converted into a product in a chemical reaction may have a, a chem an activation energy that is required, a small chemical payoff that is uh, needed before you can actually begin this reaction and convert reactants to products. What enzymes do is they reduce this uh, small hill that you have to surmount, that they reduce the amount of energy that is required to begin this reaction. The activation energy is lower with an enzyme compared to without. What we see here is a reaction that really is very unlikely to occur. What we have are two amino acids, alanines, shown here, which react with each other, releasing water in the process, and combine. This process, if you imagine repeated over a long time, uh, over a long period, and using many of these molecules, would result in a long series of amino acids or protein. The thing is, these molecules have to come together in such unlikely ways where specific parts have to interact with each other and react in order to actually form this bond between these two. What an enzyme does is it has a region where these molecules come together in their specific orientation that this makes the reaction more likely to occur compared to otherwise. That This reaction here may not happen because as these molecules are moving around in solution, they might bump in the wrong way that, let's say, these two nitrogens bump into each other rather than this carbon and this nitrogen. And as a result, it might not occur most of the time. But with an enzyme, an enzyme might bring these together in such a way that this reaction is going to happen. Enzymes, as we said before, are a uh, protein that, just like all proteins, they have to be folded in the correct way to be able to carry out their function. And this is an example enzyme that we can use to illustrate this point. This is catalase. These folds show you how the long chain of amino acids is twisted in order to make this catalytic molecule, one that carries out a chemical reaction. 
Specifically, catalase breaks down a very poisonous compound called hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. Hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, broken down into H2O and oxygen, O2. This enzyme, we can think about not just the shape of it, but the atoms involved as well, has a region where the substrate binds. The substrate is the molecule that the enzyme acts upon. In this case, the substrate molecule is actually very tiny compared to the uh, enzyme itself. The active site is the region where this substrate is reacted with. This is where all of the action occurs. We can again use a different uh, way of showing this enzyme. This is a schematic model showing you the folded shape of uh, this enzyme as well as the active site, a specifically shaped region where this substrate can bind. Due to the shape of the active site itself, the enzyme is very particular, very specific for some substrate that not all substrate shapes can actually fit into the active site. And as a result, the enzyme can only act upon certain substrates. That we refer to this as the lock and key model of enzyme function, that just as a lock might only be able to be opened by one key. In the same way, a particular enzyme might only react with one substrate, that only one substrate can fit in the active site in the correct way, and as a result, only one type of reaction can occur. Let's look at some example enzymes that you have in your body. This first one is called sucrase. These enzymes, as it's noted up here, are named for the reactions they occur. This makes it easy to figure out what they do. Sucrase, for example, as the name implies, breaks down sucrose. Sucrose is another name for table sugar. It is a disaccharide made of two component monosaccharide sugars. Uh, in this case, it is uh, glucose and fructose stuck together. So, this enzyme binds uh, sucrose, then breaks it down and releases the products that can be used for further reactions. Another enzyme we can consider is protein A's. As the name implies, it breaks down, I'm sorry, it attaches, it makes large protein. What we see is these amino acids, just as we saw earlier with alanine, they fit into the active site and the enzyme actually makes a bond between these two and releases this diamino acid or dipeptide as it's called which can then participate in further reactions of, it, of its own. As we can see here, all enzymes, by the way, end in ASE, that uh, both sucrase and proteinases are enzymes. You know this because of the ASE ending. Enzymes are continually reused as well. That, as we can see here, you have the enzyme, you have a substrate molecule which binds with the active site, the reaction occurs, and the products are released. But, the enzyme can then go back to the, the start, that it is not affected by the reaction. Its temporary use means that it can be used again and again, that you only need a small amount of enzymes, maybe only a few enzyme molecules in a given cell to carry out all of that cell's reactions of that type. There are various environmental factors that affect uh, enzyme function, as well, the structure of the enzyme is very important. Just as with all proteins, the folded shape of the enzyme is very important in allowing to carry out its function. So, anything that affects the structure will affect the function of an enzyme. The first thing we can consider is something like a, the order of amino acids. If you have a different order of amino acids, you would have a different folded shape and as a result have a different function overall. And that, uh, as well, we can consider the denaturing of an enzyme. If an enzyme is denatured or unfolded, you get a disruption of the hydrogen bonds that hold this twisted looping structure together. If these hydrogen bonds are broken, this enzyme can unfold or denature. The denaturing is destructive to an enzyme's activity because it has no active site left anymore where it can bind to its substrate and carry out the reaction it's supposed to. There are a variety of factors that can cause the enzyme to become denatured. And as well, there are some uh, environmental factors that can actually lead to uh, changes in the uh, order of amino acids. For example, if you have a mutation, let's say, in your DNA, remember your genes refers to a section of DNA 
which codes for a protein. If you have a mutation in a gene that is a change in your DNA, what can happen is that the correct amino acid uh, sequence, which is seen here, folded up into a protein, does not occur. That when a mutation does occur, what you get is a chain of amino acids, which is slightly different, that you also get a different folded protein that results. And this wrong shape means that it cannot bind with the substrates it needs to and carry out the reactions that it needs to. Mutations can destroy an enzyme's activity. And as well, factors like temperature and pH can affect an enzyme too. Temperature, we can consider in terms of optima. An optimum refers to the ideal temperature uh, that an enzyme operates at. Uh, we can use a graph to illustrate this point. What we have here is temperature along this axis, the independent variable, and dependent, uh, the rate of reaction. Let's say how many product molecules are made every second or minute. For your body, enzymes have an activity, uh, a maximum activity at around 37 degrees, between 35 and 40 degrees Celsius, or 95 to 104 degrees Fahrenheit that uh, at this point the enzyme is folded up into the correct structure and can bounce around and carry out reactions as necessary. If we were to raise the temperature, what you get is an unfolding of this protein that the hydrogen bonds are disrupted, unfolding the protein itself, this denaturing of the protein destroys its activity. On the other side, if the temperature drops too low as well, what you get is effectively the enzyme is starting to move more slowly. If the temperature drops to zero, for example, it can freeze up. That Because it's moving more slowly, it bumps into fewer substrate molecules, and as a result, there are fewer uh, reactions that occur, which means the reaction rate drops a lot. We can use cooking to illustrate the effect of temperature on proteins that foods like meat are full of protein and we enjoy the changes in texture and flavor that come about as a result of cooking that when you cook proteins they unfold they denature into a different form which we find pleasing especially as we eat it all the time we can use eggs as well again eggs tons of proteins in them when you crack one and it's uh, on a cool pan that it is a uh, the uh, yolk is yellow and uh, the, uh, all this, this other stuff around it is clear. As you cook it, though, you start to see changes in uh, the albumin that is this, uh, this clear business around it, that these proteins in the albumin are changing. They are actually denaturing in heat and then sticking together, creating this, uh, this not see-through mass anymore. It's opaque to light. It turns a different color as a result of changes in the proteins that are found there. That eggs actually are a good way to illustrate a variety of different uh, effects of environmental uh, factors on a protein because you can heat them up and it changes them from clear and runny to kind of hard and yellow. Uh, the, if you uh, actually subject them to pressure, similar things happen. Uh, pH, extremes in acidity or base, can actually uh, completely denature proteins as well as various salts, as well as whipping that uh, what you're doing here is stirring up the proteins and causing them to unfold and take on air as well, becoming fluffy in the process. That eggs, uh, the proteins in eggs are a good way to illustrate changes in protein structure. The last thing we can come to as well that also affects a uh, protein's uh, structure and function is pH. That you might have uh, in the past had ceviche, which is a dish from Central and South America, uh, which is made from fresh raw fish with citrus, that is lemon juice or something similar on it, that uh, what you get when you add lemon juice to meat, you unfold these proteins and cause a, an effect that is similar to cooking, that adding lemon juice to meat is the, uh, causes the same kind of reaction as does cooking too. Again, we can use a uh, handy graph to illustrate the uh, changes in a, an enzyme's reaction rates uh, as pH changes, that uh, you have different enzymes in your body that have different optima of pH. If you, let's say, have skin cells uh, that are at pH 7, their enzymes work very well at pH 7, but enzymes that uh, work in your stomach, like pepsin, for example, which breaks down proteins, have an optimum that is much lower. On the other side, trypsin, an intestinal enzyme, as a, uh, a, an activity at a much higher pH, pH 8. 
So, in summary, what's so important about an enzyme is its shape. 